So currently, one of the most important environmental issues of our time is related to high atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. And as these levels continue to rise, our global climate is changing, as you all know. These things are having very grave effects on our surrounding environment. So the key is, is that in the future, we expect that this is going to cause lots of death, right? So in a recent United Nations report, they report that in as, as little as 15 years, we could experience as much as a 40% water shortfall with continued climate change. And so now it's time we have the opportunity to make a change. And so today I would like to show you how we can begin to do that by implementing a variety of different technologies. So a lot of people ask why I decided to become a professor and why environmentally related issues. And for me, there's no one thing that's happened in my life, but many that have led me on this career path. Uh, first, I was born into a family. I was brought up in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in South Carolina. And my family, by American standards, really didn't have a lot of money. So rather than traveling and things, uh, as a child, outside of school, of course, I spent lots of time outdoors, hiking, fishing, climbing trees, and learning to play a variety of outdoor sports. And it was really during this time that I gained a strong appreciation for nature and my environment. Um, and this has really been prevalent throughout my career. As a young adolescent and early teenager, I experienced some very traumatic things in my life. Um, and I believe that part of my survival and getting through this process was because I was always surrounded by really fantastic, supportive people. So mentors throughout my life telling me what I could do, what I could change, who I could become. And at some point, I began to believe these people, and I began to visualize my future, right? And once that happened, doors began to open for me, and one of those doors was higher education. So one of the local universities actually gave me an athletic scholarship to study, which was great. I got to um, paid to play, essentially. So uh, during this time, I got to study chemistry, figure out how I could apply my skill set to help the environment. But I also got to meet, for the first time, a wide variety of different types of people that were culturally diverse. And what I began to realize is that people are limited by many things in life, as I was, economic, social, cultural things, but as well as environmental things, things that in developed countries we take really for granted. And so currently, I have the opportunity to lead a fantastic group of scientists. Um, now I'm the mentor, and I get to give back what was so graciously given to me. Um, and of course, we're working on environmental issues because that is dear to my heart. So my group is currently designing novel filter materials so that we can use these to purify air and purify water. And the reason that this work is so important is because currently 25% of the global death rate is due to environmental pollution. And with continued climate change, these numbers will continue to increase significantly. So if you were to look at a map that reflects death rate, what you'll find is that in underdeveloped countries and developing places, that death rate is much higher. So what we're doing is essentially creating a situation where access to clean air and clean water is really becoming a birthright. To me, this is a bit of a travesty. This should be a basic human right. And so we're trying to work very hard to help these things. So if you travel throughout Africa, if you go to places like Cambodia and Southeast Asia, what you'll find are children drinking water littered with harmful organics, bacteria, and heavy metals. If you travel to more populated places, say India and China, what you'll find are children wearing face masks because of the automobile exhaust is emitting so many particulates in the air, it's causing uh, very bad respiratory infections and things. And so the biggest situation that we face with environmental pollution, air pollution, is how much CO2 that we're currently emitting into our environment. So currently, 70 to 80 percent of global emissions, or 70 to 80 percent of global energy consumption, basically, is produced by the combustion of fossil-based fuels. So as we burn these fuels, CO2 is emitted into our atmosphere. And the problem is, is that Earth's natural cycles cannot take care of all of the CO2 that we're emitting. So it's growing in our atmosphere, and this is known to be a greenhouse gas, so that means that it absorbs and it re-emits heat that's reflected off of the Earth's crust. 
And it serves as like a blanket, so our planet is beginning to warm, essentially, as that CO2 in our atmosphere is growing. So while I don't want to overwhelm you with a bunch of data, um, there are a lot of skeptics in the world that don't believe in climate change, right? We've heard a lot of this going on in the U.S., right? Um, <laughs> so the, the biggest argument is that Earth's CO2 levels have always fluctuated. So what I'm showing you are the CO2 levels over the last 400,000 years. You'll see peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs. So these people are right. The CO2 levels do fluctuate, okay? At the peaks, it's where the CO2 levels are highest and our global temperature is warm. At the trough, it's where it's colder, right? Because the CO2, the CO2 levels are lower. And this is where we have our ice ages. What I would like to point to you is what's happening currently. Look at that. The CO2 levels have skyrocketed. So not our, only are we at levels that we've never seen before throughout our history, but we're increasing at a rate that's never been seen before. So this is why most uh, climate scientists will agree that indeed this is man-induced. And I should tell you, that these increases have occurred since the end of the Industrial Revolution, where we began really combusting these fossil fuels uh, for energy use. So then what's it doing to our planet, right? Our glaciers are melting. We all know about that. Um, our oceans are rising and acidifying, and it's really affecting very strongly surrounding ecological systems. Um, the key is, is not just that change is happening. The key is the rate with which the change is happening. So you can imagine that while developed countries can invest resources in order to keep up with this change, underdeveloped countries are not so fortunate. And so when they begin to experience long-term droughts, for instance, the crops that they are so dependent on for their livelihood, basically it's going to cause widespread starvation. So it's important that we begin to invest resources not just in adapting to change, but in fixing the problem that we've created. So there are a variety of ways that we can do that. Many people will tell you, oh, you should change your lifestyle. Ride your bike, don't take that trip. But I'm going to tell you it's not in human nature to actually change your lifestyle to benefit people 50, 60 years down the road. So what I've done is identified three things that can significantly reduce our global CO2 emissions. Um, there's more, but these three things, I think, can make a very strong impact. So the first, if we're burning the fossil fuels to produce energy, we simply try to minimize the energy associated with various processes. And a lot of people don't know this, but the chemical industry consumes about 10 to 15 percent of global energy, just separating, for instance, small molecules and, and things in, in gas phase and liquid phase, right? So if we can design these novel filter materials and we can do these separations, with less energy input, then there's a lot of energy we can save and hence less CO2 that we emit. The second method should be pretty obvious. So carbon-based fossil fuels are non-renewable, right? This means we're going to run out eventually anyway. So it's very important that we begin investing lots of resources in converting to renewable clean energy like wind, like solar, like nuclear, like hydro, right? So the problem is, is that energy transitions are historically slow. And as a result, we know that we'll continue using fossil fuels for many years to come. And so this brings us to the third topic. And that is, if we're going to continue burning fossil fuels, we have to find a way to capture that CO2. In order to do that, we have to know where the CO2 is coming from. So what we would like to do is go to these point sources, grab that CO2 before it's ever emitted into the atmosphere. And so essentially, I've, I've identified two large point sources for you. The, the first, of course, is associated with the automobile industry. So transportation produces about 23% of global CO2 emissions. And then large-scale power plants produce 42%. So this is, these are used basically to produce electricity that you use to heat and cool your home. So what might this look like? Essentially, we would like to design special sponge materials that we could go and put inside of that flue, right? And that sponge, like your sponge in your kitchen, selectively, it, it, it grabs water as you wash dishes. We would like to design a sponge that can selectively grab that CO2 from that flue gas stream. And then we can emit the other gases, the less harmful gases, into the atmosphere. So in response to this, many 
uh, scientists have been working feverishly around the world on various types of porous materials. Basically, molecular sponges, like I showed you previously. Um, so what I would like to introduce you to is the world's most porous material, and this is what my group is currently working with. They're known as metal organic frameworks. These materials, one gram, these materials have this, the highest surface area in the world. So I'd like for you guys to kind of think about this. What do you think the surface area of these materials would be equivalent to? Is it maybe a European football? Maybe the stage we're standing on? Or maybe the room that we're standing in? Right? So the key is, is that these materials have very small pores, about 50,000 times smaller than the size of a human hair. And actually, my question was a trick question because the surface area of these materials are much bigger than this room about 7,000 meters squared in a single gram. So this is equivalent to that of European football field. It's pretty amazing, huh? So if you go inside these materials, basically you'll find that there's mostly open space, right? That the walls are atoms thick. And so like you decorate your Christmas tree, what we do as chemists is we go inside and we hang special functional groups inside that can grab that carbon dioxide. And so, along with our group, many groups around the world, there are lots of different types of materials that can grab CO2 from flue gas, exhaust gas, air, right? While we would like to continue improving the efficiency of these materials, the technology really is here. So then a lot of people ask, well, why is it not implemented? Why are we still emitting so much CO2? And the key is, is that carbon capture is a really big scale problem. And it's going to be extremely costly. And so the reason that we're not implementing it is because we're not taking responsibility for the problems that we've created. So before I tell you the top CO2 producers in the world, I would just like to say that this is a global effort. We all have to work together in order to fix this problem. Um, because we all use energy, right? But the top CO2 producers in the world, the United States, this is just since the 1850s, since the end of the Industrial Revolution. The US is in number one sp spot with 27% of global emissions. Europe is in second at 25%, and China is in third at 11%. Now, China will, of course, catch up. They're going to emit a lot of CO2 because they're developing, and they've got a huge population. Um, but this is how it stands, and this is why it's so disappointing to me when I see our U.S. administration decide to remove themselves from things like the Paris Agreement because it's too costly to Americans. Well, based on the information that you have, shouldn't it be a bit costly? So the last thing that I would like to say is that a lot of people ask, well, what can I do? I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a scientist. And the thing that I tell them is, well, you're a taxpayer, therefore, you're electing the people that make the policy. And so I believe that education, knowing what the problems are, is the most important thing. And that way we make the right choices when we vote. And we get people who are interested in developing and leading policy, and also people that are very interested in, for instance, closing coal mines and putting those people to work in clean energy. So with that, I, I would like to say that with continued education, we can bring what I consider to be an epidemic of ignorance and self-interest to an end as it is continuing to enable climate change. Thank you.